Amen. Uh, turn the book of Genesis 16 with me this morning, please. You're going to find now as we study the Jew that the book of Genesis becomes very important. And while you're turning there, uh, Genesis 16, I want to bring a couple of things to your attention. I received this over the website in the last couple of days. And this is a direct, uh, I just printed it out. This is what uh, the person said. I pray for a day when the doctrine of hell is dead. The doctrine of hell is Catholic nonsense. I despise Catholic nonsense. Jesus Christ did not believe in hell. He was a Jew. Jews do not believe in hell. It was the Latin church that turned into the Catholic church that made hell into a doctrine. Hell is a nasty lie that goes in the face of the Hebrew God. Now, uh, you can, uh, if you know, if you if you read and and begin to kind of uh, uh, look at what you're reading there and think on it, uh, this is not a a, uh, a a a critical statement in the sense of being critical. This is someone who who to me it sounds like they're reaching out, they're hurt, and the doctrine of hell bothers them. It bothers them. That's why they've gone to know a little bit about history, you know. And, uh, of course, they don't know anything about the Bible. It's obvious. But they had it, it was bothering them enough to put it in the prayer page. You see, that's how I got this. It came through our prayer page on the line of Judah. Now, did the Lord Jesus believe in hell? Well, of course he did. He preached more on hell than anybody. Nobody ever lived on this earth that preached more on hell than he did. Uh, but... Uh, According to the scripture, the location of hell was in the heart of the earth. Now, we know what science says about the heart of the earth, and, and as, as long as science agrees with the Bible, got no problem with it. But I have no use for science falsely so-called. Brother Valance sent me, sent me a reference the other day to a video about uh, major news discovery here in the uh, about 600 miles underneath the earth's surface there is a transition zone between the mantle of the earth and what lies beneath. And they have discovered that there is an enormous amount of water underneath the, uh, the mantle. And this water is found in the form of a, uh, it's called a, uh, where is this thing? I've got it here somewhere. I should, uh, well, anyway. <coughs> I should have written it down. I can't remember every one of these things, but something they had that uh, it was in the form of, uh, here it is, ring woodite. Ring woodite is a mineral that absorbs water. And according to their estimations, there is over three times as much water underneath the surface of the earth, about, I think, maybe four to 600 miles down, than all of the oceans of the earth combined. That's a lot of water. Now, of course, some of our brethren have immediately seized upon that to say the fountains of the deep were broken up. And when the flood came upon the earth, and who am I to say they're wrong? Before the flood, before the, uh, before the change of the earth, before the, the antediluvian time, and then afterward, uh, the, it had never rained, and there was a canopy that covered the earth. And we need to know that because that's important to understand the, the geology of the earth and the geography of the earth. So when he broke up the fountains of the deep, and the waters came down from above, and they have discovered that there is water up there too, has come down from above, and the waters came up from beneath, in 40 days' time it had covered 29,000 plus feet, which is the top of Everest. There was a worldwide flood. So when they discover water underneath the earth's surface, four to 600 miles down, it doesn't surprise me a bit, does it you? No, not a bit, because uh, I believe the Bible. And as long as geology, archeology, span anthropology, and all the rest of the ologies match up with the Bible, good for them. But if they ever cross the scripture, I cross them, because I believe the Bible. Man in his ignorance and limited knowledge assumes that he knows more than the Bible. But the Bible has never been proven wrong. Amen. And it never will be. So I thought I'd mention that to you. And it gives you an idea of what's going on in the world. I feel sorry for this person who wrote that. And I'll pray for them. 
And uh, that's the purpose of our ministry. The purpose of that website is not to be on there as some kind of a sledgehammer ministry. It's to be on there to help people. And that's why I'm there. I had a lot of questions before I got saved, 1973. I had a lot of questions. I observed a lot of things didn't like, a lot of things about religion I didn't like, a lot of things about religion I still don't like. But in 1973, I met God. And there's a difference. I came face to face with my maker. Amen. That settled a lot of questions for me. And I pray that uh, all of you have too. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, notice that they both have different names at this point. Her name is not Sarah. His name is not Abraham. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. She had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah, or Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. He went in unto Hagar, she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. When she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand to do, uh, do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Now pick it up here. It's very important. And the angel of the Lord found her by the fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself into her hands. And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall, be not, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, shalt call his name Ishmael. That's important. Because the Lord hath heard thy affliction, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all of his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the Lord was called, well, wherefore the well was called Bir Laharoi, because it is between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. That name Ishmael means God hears. Now, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 22, verse 32. Matthew 22, 32. Here our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking very plainly and clearly to an issue. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Ishmael. Is that not right? Is that important? That makes all the difference in the world. That's the issue to this very day. The Lord Jesus says, I am the God of I, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, what was Jacob's name changed to? Israel. Who was Jacob the father of? The 12 tribes of Israel. Where did the Jew come from? Jacob. Well, yes, Judah, but the Jew came from, came from the loins of Jacob. All right? The Jew is a hated, despised individual by millions on the face of this earth literally hated to, uh, to total extinction if possible. The Jew is. And this is why it relates directly this morning to the Jew and to the, the uh, succession of birth, the progeny of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. If I ask a Muslim who is a son of Abraham, is he a son of Abraham? Yes. Absolutely. 
If I ask a Muslim today uh, what succession, what, was the, what would be the spiritual succession, the, the succession of authority, here's what he'd tell me. And I'm going to read this to you. This is the graph that, that I got directly from them. Adam. Adam was the first man of the earth. Noah, son of Adam. Ibrahim, or Abraham, son of Noah. Abraham had two sons. The line splits now. This is important. It splits at Abraham. He has Isaac and he has Ishmael. If I follow the lineage of Isaac, I come down to Musa or Moses. If I follow on further, I come down to Mary or Miriam. And then from Mary, I have Issa or Jesus. And then it stops there. It stops at Jesus through Isaac. If I come down now through the Muslim genealogy, we'll start at Abraham. We'll come to Ishmael. Ishmael. From Ishmael, we'll drop on down to Abu Mutalib. Abu Mutalib was the father of Muhammad. Who is Muhammad? He's the prophet of Islam. What do the, what do the Muslims say about Jesus? He's a prophet. Why is he a prophet? Because he is one of the two sons. He is of one of the two sons of Abraham. They consider him a prophet. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Therefore, according to them, according, according to the, they allow the fact that Isaac is a genuine progression of spiritual authority and revelation to mankind. And so, therefore, Isaac beget through generations, he beget Jesus, was of Isaac and of that side of the family. Ishmael was of Abraham on the other side of the family. We have Abraham and we have Isaac. We have, we have Ishmael and we have Isaac. All right? We have two separate uh, lineages, uh, completely uh, separate from each other, yet Islam recognizes on the side of Isaac that there is certain, I hate to use the word apostolic succession, certain spiritual succession and divine revelation from God. Now, Ishmael therefore is the father, according to much of the writings in the Arab literature, of the Arabs of the northern area. Ishmael is their father. They claim him as their father. So that gives us a direct connection to Ishmael and the Arab. Now Isaac begat Jacob. If you'll notice, Jacob is not in the genealogy. It's only Ishmael and Isaac. Why is Jacob not in the genealogy because as far as the Muslim is concerned Jacob has no spiritual authority no spiritual right because it was from Jacob that came forth the Jew and as far as the Muslim is concerned the Bible is a Jewish product being a Jewish product not God ordained and God inspired like we believe 1st Timothy being a Jewish product if you can nail that, if you can make people believe that the Bible is nothing more than a Jewish uh, creation, then what you've done is reduce it, reduce the Bible to an ethnicity, to their own personal agenda, to whatever they want the world to know about themselves. And therefore, they're going to spin everything to make the Jew look good in their own light, in the light of the world. And it is no longer the inspired Word of God. That's why... On the other side, you have the Quran. The Quran was written by Muhammad. Muhammad wrote a commentary on the Quran, which is called the Hadith. The Hadith, to most Muslims, is more important than the Quran because it is, it is Muhammad's own commentary on the Quran. Plainer words, I can say, you know what semantics? You know what a semantic is? A semantic is. Uh, fire, all right? But what's fire mean to you? What's fire mean to you? What do you understand fire to be? What kind of fire? It's all that. It's the meaning of the word. It's the nuances involved in understanding it. And so Muhammad wrote the Hadith to interpret and comment on the Quran, 
which is the holy book of Islam. Now, if you're a Christian, what is your holy book? King James Bible. <laughs> the KJB, right? The Bible, folks. The Bible. All right? That's your, and what, did, what, can, what makes up the Bible? All right? All right? The Bible is made up of a number of books, 66. What about the Apocrypha? What about Tobit and Bel and the Dragon, Judith? What about the Book of Enoch? What about the Book of Esdras? What about the Gnostic Gospels? What about the pseudepigraphic writings? What about all that other stuff? Harry Potter. Yeah. Harry Potter. What about Harry Potter? <laughs> what about Oprah Winfrey? You know, what about pop fi uh, psychology and philosophy and theology? Uh, what about what they're going to believe in 2050? I mean, that's constantly evolving. It, it, it always evolves according to the standard of the culture that it, that it lives in. And it always evolves according to, the, according to the comfort zone of the people who evolve it. What makes them feel good makes them feel better. And that they create their own theology. That's what sets the Bible apart. It doesn't create anything comfortable for man. It tells you what you are. It tells you what your problem is. Then it tells you the remedy. But in any event, the Bible is the holy book. Now, Islam has a holy place, and they have three holy places, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. But the most holy place in Islam has a stone attached to it, a black stone that fell down from heaven. It came down white and then changed black. It came down white and then changed into black when it received all the sins of the world. And that black stone is housed in a square, cub cubicle-shaped uh, edifice in the midst of the most holy mosque on the face of the earth. It's called the Kaaba, and it's located in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Once in a lifetime, every Muslim, if possible, is required to make a pilgrimage to Mecca how many's ever seen a video of tens of thousands of people as they circle around? That they're circling around that stone that is housed inside the Kaaba. Islamic tradition has it that Abraham built that, the first one. Remember, is Abraham important to the Muslim? You better believe it. So Abraham built the Kaaba. Why did he build it? Because it was the first place, dating all the way back to Adam, where man ever worshipped God. And it was the Kaaba in Mecca where he erected this edifice, this square type structure, to house this stone that had fallen down from heaven that had become, that was, by virtue of the fact that it was there, it was at that location where it came down and all this happened. That was the most holy spot on earth. So Abraham, along with Ishmael, built this mosque as a place of worship of Almighty God. So it is the oldest mosque. And of course, a mosque, it wasn't a mosque at that time, but it was a place of worship and became what's called, a, understood to be a mosque under Muhammad. How many of you follow me so far? Now, you say, oh, the people believe this. Absolutely believe it. When you get into the book of Acts, you'll find out that uh, one time the Apostle Paul encountered pagans who believed that something had fallen down from heaven. Remember? It's not unusual. It's not unusual at all to get into the pagan world and see where they're talking about things that fell down from heaven. Well, stuff falls down from heaven all the time. A meteorite hit Russia about a year or two ago, and I'm telling you, it lit the whole sky up, shook buildings, busted glass, and women were screaming. <laughs> and that thing flew across the sky at thousands of miles an hour, and of course, most a lot of them just disintegrate before they hit the ground. So stuff is falling down from heaven all the time. But they trace it back to Abraham. It's very important to them. The Kaaba stone is very important to them. It's the most holy place on the face of the earth. What's the most holy place on the face of the earth for a Christian? 
That's kind of a tricky question. <laughs> Every place you put your foot. Every place that you put your foot is holy unto the Lord. You're not bound to a place. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, God said, I'll put my name in Jerusalem. And it was in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, on top of Moriah. That was the holiest place on the face of the earth for the Old Testament Jew. Many of the rabbis teach, many of them teach, that the very spot of the Holy of Holies, where the Temple of Solomon was built. You've got the court, holy place, holy of holies. At the very spot where the Holy of Holies was built, that God made Adam, that He created him from the dust of the ground. You say, well, I thought He, he, he made Adam in Eden. You look at the geographical dimensions of Eden, and you'll find that they go all the way from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates River in the east. Eden is a lot bigger, a lot bigger than most folks, uh, you know, most folks assume. Did God create Adam from the top of, from the dirt taken from the top of Moriah? I don't know. I can't say that he didn't. I mean, how in the world could you prove something like that? And many of the old Jewish rabbis taught for certain that that's where God made Adam. I do know this. I do know that Moriah is a mountain and that it goes to the north and that they quarried stones out of that mountain and they used those stones to build the temple. But in the process of quarrying those stones out of Moriah, they opened up an ugly structure. Stones were so ugly that they couldn't use them in building the temple. And they stood back one day and looked at those stones and lo and behold it looked like the face of a skull. And 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, He was crucified at Moriah, outside the walls of Jerusalem, where the stones had been excavated and taken out. And there was the ugly hill. And there they nailed Him on a cross on top of Moriah. Exactly. And uh, so it was there. Now, can you prove that? No, I can't prove it. But I do know this. I've been there six times, I think. At the top of that hill, within eye shot, you can look down and you can see a, a tomb that has called the garden tomb. Underneath the ground of that garden tomb is a huge water cistern, cistern that was used to collect water for the garden. And there is a first century Jewish tomb with a big stone, a place for a stone. And that's where most Christians go to when they, make a, when they go over to Jerusalem. They'll go to that place. It's called the Garden Tomb. It's got all the elements that it needed to be the place. Still can't say I can prove it, but I, I, have, I, don't have, I wouldn't try to disprove it either. And uh, as far as the Jews are concerned, the holy place was Jerusalem. Now, I want you to look at some things with me this morning. I kind of laid the foundation to give you an idea of what's going on. Uh, about the world of, of, uh, of Islam. Why do we have two separate groups of Muslims? Now, there's more breakup. You've got Sufi Muslims and so forth. But why, why do we have two distinct groups of Muslims? We have a Sunni Muslim and a Shiite Muslim. Essentially, that's it. Uh, Muhammad had a son-in-law who was his cousin. His name's Ali. He had a grandson whose name was Hussein. And after Muhammad's death, when, when the leader died, a vacuum, a vacuum ero arose immediately for leadership. And one group wanted to follow the Umayyads, and they called them caliphs, and it was a group that was essentially uh, created by their, by their own group. Uh, elected to office. The other wanted to follow the very bloodline of Muhammad, his bloodline. Here's his son-in-law, here's his grandson, right through that bloodline. And so they had a lot of friction, a lot of struggling going on over this. Finally, they murdered Ali. 
And his grandson, uh, Hussein, was killed at the Battle of Karbala. And they built a huge mosque at, the, at, 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 at Karbala, and it's in Iraq right now. You can see it anytime you want to. And he was killed at the Battle of Karbala. If you read the record, it says something like he had 70 people with him. Hussein did. The grandson of Muhammad had about 70 against thousands. And he stood and fought them, and they died. But what happened by that? They sealed the separation. That sealed the split. The split would never, they would never unite again. From that moment on, the Shiite Muslim says that the true successor to Muhammad was by blood, the bloodline, through Ali, through Hussein. And the Sunni Muslim says, no, the true successor, successor to Muhammad is the one chosen by the will of the people. And the vast majority of the Muslims have chosen so and so and so forth and so on. And so to this day, about, uh, I think the figure they usually give is about 90% of all Muslims are Sunni Muslims with about 10% as Shiite Muslims. Now this is important. Iran is a Persian nation. They're Persian. They, they speak Farsi along with, the, I'm sure, other, other languages. The Arabs speak Arabic, which is a Semitic language, which is directly connected with the Hebrew because they're connected to Abraham. All right. The Arab comes through Abraham. All right. They're Sunni Muslim. Most of the Arabs are Sunni Muslim. But Iran is Shiite Muslim. This is important. I don't know what the figure is, 80, 90, 95, 100 percent, I don't know, but the vast majority of the Iranians are Shiite Muslims. Now, in the, get this in your head about what's going on over there right now. We've had a civil war in Syria. We have an Alawite, an Alawite, uh, who is the uh, Assad, Bashir Assad, the son of Hafas Assad, who is the president of Syria, an Alawite. Now, had been rejected in the past by both branches of Islam, but the Shiites embraced them not too long ago, the Alawites. They embraced them. By embracing them, they became allies. So what's happening in Syria is that Iran, which is a Shiite nation, <coughs> has been supporting Bashir Assad in Syria against all of these rebel uprisings that have been taking place in this country, trying to, you know, take him down. They have been supporting Assad. Now, we have another group that rises up that's called ISIS. You've heard about them, I'm sure, many times the last few days. These are Sunni Muslims. These Sunni Muslims are trying to overthrow the government of Iraq because the government of Iraq is supported by Iran, a Shiite country. The reason that Iran is supporting the government of Iraq should be clear to anybody. That's their next door neighbor and they want as much influence in that country as they possibly can. And so it is with Assad, they want the influence in that country as much as they can. These are countries, these are next door neighbors, so they're going to support the ruling faction in Syria, and the same thing in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Iraq. The Sunni Muslims have, have begun to carve out a caliphate in an area between Syria and Iran. They're carving it out. They're creating another country. They're wiping out everybody that's in their way. They intend to establish and I don't know what they're going to call it, but they're going to establish another country that is, that is governed solely by Sharia law. A caliphate is, 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 is an area that is, is, that is controlled by a caliph. There's two different kinds. This is important because I'm trying to set the stage for you to show you what's... I'm going to read something for you in a minute. I'm trying to give you some kind of a background here to understand what's going on as much as I can understand it. I'm certainly no expert on this stuff. I'm like Will Rogers. All I know is what I read in the newspaper. <laughs> you don't know much, believe me. But in any event, uh, there is a vast difference in the way that a Shiite sees government and a Sunni sees government. This is important. Very important. Remember now, they're not friends. They hate each other. The Sunnis are killing the Shiites. 
The southern part of Iraq right now is basically Shiite controlled, a Shiite, Shiite area. And when Saddam Hussein was the uh, dictator of Iraq, by sheer brute force, he was able to keep Shiite, Sunni, and Kurd, which is another entity, the Kurds, the Shiites, and the Sunnis, he was able to keep them all under one umbrella. They never liked each other, never did. But because of his iron-fisted control, uh, Saddam Hussein was able to, to carve out a nation, keep it going. And of course, when they went in there and removed him, they didn't put anything in his place. I don't know if the West, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what their real motive is and all this stuff. I don't know why they are caught. I mean, I'm just a little old Baptist preacher up here in front of you this morning. I don't understand why in the world that they can't see this stuff coming, why they, can't, why they don't have advisors that say, look, these people are going to kill each other as soon as they can. And that's exactly what's going on now. They're killing you. They warned them. If they'd listened to the general officers, and I've listened to some of these generals, and they know what they're talking about. You don't become a four-star general and ignorant. These men know what they're talking about. And they saw this coming. And, uh, but I don't know what the politicians, I'm, you know, they, they, they do according to what's uh, politically expedient and what have you. In any event, you have Shiite, Sunni, and Kurd. Hussein was able to bring them together. When his regime was broken up, then all of this, these, these factions and splinter groups began to break up. And now you have a stronghold being built between Syria and Iraq, and it is controlled by Sunni Muslims. Iran doesn't like it, and Iran is already sending troops into, into Iraq, and Iran is going to do something about it. Iran is not going to let them carve out a Sunni nation right next door to them. They're going to do something to stop it. And the United States has a president who plays golf and talks. How many agree with that? He's a good talker and he plays golf. Yes, sir. Be one fine mess, wouldn't it? I mean, it happened immediately. So they left him in there. So now what do we got? Well, here's what we have. We have Iran, a very powerful nation. Iran is not Egypt. Iran is not Syria. Iran is not Iraq. Iran has a first-rate army, a military. All right? You're not going to knock Iran over in a week or two. It's not going to happen. Uh, no doubt the United States can overwhelm them. We're a so-called superpower and all that, militarily, what have you. But the bottom line is Iran is a, is a hornet's nest. The Straits of Hormuz over there in the, right above the, the, uh, the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, uh, uh, and around, uh, around the Arabian Peninsula, the Straits of Hormuz, you go up through there, you have to go into an area that Iran controls, and it can shut, off, it, can shut it off at any time. Uh, it pleases, and when it does, it, it, it sh turns off the oil spigot for a big portion of the oil. Your gas prices go from, um, from $3.50 a gallon to uh, $7, $10 a gallon overnight, just like that. All that's, and that could happen, could happen any minute. So the president has to juggle all of this, and I don't envy him. He's got a mess on his hands. He's got a real problem. But I want you to hear now what an imam in Iran has to say. Now I'm going to say this before I read what he says. An imam is a spiritual leader. I M A M. He's a spiritual leader in Islam either side. But on the Sunni side, he's elected by the people. All right, or chosen by the people, followed by the people, understood to be a teacher, a leader and what have you, you know, respected. So he's an imam. He's a, he's a preacher, he's a teacher. But on the Shiite side, they don't see it that way. They see him as a directly called, anointed prophet or preacher of God. Divine choice. When the Ayatollah Hurahola Hu, Humani, that had been exiled in France, I don't know how long he was over there, but he was in France. You remember him? How many remember, you remember when they overran our embassy over there in Iran? When Humani, Humani, uh, they, they got rid of the Shah of Iran, they got rid of the, of the peacock throne. And when they, when they got rid of him, what happened was the Shah of Iran, the, the Ayatollah Khomeini that was, that was exiled in, in France, 
came back into Iran, the people ran into the streets and went screaming mad. And the reason they did is because he was anointed of God. He is divinely chosen of God. When he speaks, it is as if God is speaking. He has that kind of authority. Unlike the Sunni Muslim, when that, when that, when that imam, and they call him Ayatollah in Iran, when he speaks, this is why they are the ones who control the government in Iran. Not the prime minister or president who's elected. All right. Listen to who the head man in Iran now says. And believe him when he says it. Iran's supreme leaders promising a world free of infidels and non-believers with the coming of the Islamic Messiah, Mahdi, a ninth century descendant of the prophet Muhammad, whom the Shiites refer to as the 12th Imam. The coming of Imam Zamam Madhi is the definite promise by Allah, quotes Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. He said in a speech Wednesday on the anniversary of Mahdi's birthday at an exhibition of research historical documents on the 12th Imam. Khamenei says one of Allah's promises was that an Islamic revolution would come to Iran. Quote again, who would have thought that in this sensitive region and in this important country with a regime run by Shah Pahlavi, that was the name of the Shah of Iran, and supported by the international powers, a, rev a revolution based on religion and Sharia law would take place? Who would have ever thought it, he says? Khamenei asks, the Shiite clerical establishment ruling Iran believes that Iran's 79 revolution was a precursor to the coming Mahdi. Now listen carefully during which all infidels will be killed and the flag of Islam will be raised in all four corners of the world. The caravan of humanity, quoting him again, the caravan of humanity from the day of creation has been moving through the windings of the haze, hard haze of life to reach an open path. And this open path is that of the time of the coming of Imam Mahdi, he said. The awaiting for the coming is a hopeful and powerful wait, providing the biggest opening for the Islamic society, the Supreme Leader says. And uh, the Supreme Leader's representative of the Revolutionary Guards, Ali Saeed, said the coming of Imam Mahdi cannot take place, now listen carefully, cannot take place under the current circumstances. And in order for that to happen, the Middle East needs to witness major changes to create those changes. Listen carefully. There is a need for regional preparedness and that the Islamic revolution in Iran, without a doubt, will be connected to the worldwide revolution of Imam Mahdi. The secret documentary, The Coming is Upon Us, produced by the regime for the preparedness of his forces, Hezbollah and other Shiite jihadists, and revealed in 2011, covers the centuries-old hadiths by Muhammad and his descendants in providing a timeline of events and what needs to happen, needs to happen for the coming of the Mahdi. Now you're getting this. This has to happen first then the Mahdi comes. Now listen carefully. The warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan is one example of what the Hadiths predicted. Remember the Hadith is Muhammad's commentary on the Quran. According to Shiite theology, the fighting in Assyria and the current fighting in Iraq and even the likely intrusion of the Islamic Republic's army into Iraq to counter the Sunni rebellion as per Shiite understanding of the Hadiths point to the imminent coming of Mahdi, but not before Israel is destroyed. Start adding it up. They want their Mahdi back, but they're going to wipe that bunch of Jews off of the face of the earth first. And that's not all. They've got bigger plans. Yes, sir. Yeah. So there's, the Quran talks about a ball of fire into Jerusalem. Uh huh. Yes, sir. Now that provides the motivation for 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 the uh, the Confederacy to come down from the north against Israel. Mm -hmm. That will give rise to the Antichrist when mm -hmm. he comes in. I mean, the real Antichrist, not mm -hmm. not not the uh, mm -hmm. Mahdi. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
I know that. So uh, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of argument about who the Antichrist is. It, nobody really knows, but I don't think it's going to be Iran. But what I'm going to try to do here this morning is show you how that the mindset of Iran, <laughs> what they intend to do. Listen carefully. Iran's clerical rulers believe the figure Sayyid Khorasani, who at the end of times facilitates the coming and passing the flag of Islam to Imam Mahdi, is the current supreme leader of the regime, Ayatollah Khomeini. In the documentary, close associates of Khomeini reveal that he personally has acknowledged his role as the facilitator of the coming. Khomeini also stated openly, I can tell you with utmost confidence, the promise of Allah for the coming and the establishment of new Islamic civilization is on its way. The Obama administration is currently engaged in intensive negotiations over the regime's illicit nuclear and missile program. Iran insists on its right to enrichment and the expansion of nuclear research and development, but international analysts believe the goal is to acquire nuclear weapons to use against Israel, now watch this, and the United States. The Supreme Leader in another recent statement covered the Daily Caller, bluntly said that Yihad will continue until America is destroyed. This battle will only end when society can get rid of the oppressor's front with America at the head of it, which has expanded its claws on human mind, body, and thought that requires a difficult and lengthy struggle and need for a great, need for great strides, he said. Now, let's step back. Let's look at what's going on and see if we can get our perspective right. What is the Mahdi to these people? He's not God. The Jewish Messiah to the Jews, not God. You say, I thought Messiah meant he was God. No, that doesn't mean he's God. It means he's the anointed of God. Mashiach in Hebrew means anointed one. What's the world looking for? It's looking for some kind of a human God, a peacemaker. That's what he's going to be. He will declare himself to be God. There you get into semantics. What does God mean to a pagan? They have identified everything under the sun as God. In other words, when a pagan tells me his definition and understanding of God, it doesn't mean a thing to me. The only definition and understanding of who God is is what the Bible says. That almighty, eternal, invisible, absolute being that is from everlasting to everlasting who manifested himself in flesh 2,000 years ago as the God-man. Anything else from that is just a bunch of pagan nonsense. That's it, period. They don't have a clue who God is. All right. So the Antichrist is going to profess himself to be God. And it's not a problem with a pagan who doesn't have a clue anyway who God is. Here are the Muslims, the Shiites, are looking for a Mahdi to come back. The twelfth Imam, okay? This, this, this chosen one of Allah. And he's coming. And when he comes, he's going to bring what they expect for him to bring. But in order for him to come, according to what I've just read to you, is that they've got to get rid of Israel. And they're going to get rid of the United States. Say, so can they do it, preacher? Well, what if they let Iran develop a nuclear weapon? The nuclear weapon that Iran develops does not have to be big enough to blow up America. All it has to be big enough is just to start a blow up of America. Because once a nuclear conflagration starts, there's no ending to it. Except those days should be short and no flesh should be left alive. The best place to be if a nuclear holocaust takes place is ground zero. You're just vaporized and that's it. Faster than a, than a, than a, than a speeding bullet. <laughs> you, you, won't be, <laughs> you won't have to go through anything. It's all over with. You're, just, you're thinking one moment, the next moment you're in glory. Just that fast. That's the best place to be. 
there's nothing left at ground zero. A 50 megaton bomb goes off, there's nothing left. Yes? Right. They kind of care the of them. Well, they tell the truth, don't they? <laughs> yeah. But you, <laughs> well, that's very true. <laughs> that's very true. But it's that thing about it's that thing about God's chosen people. All oh, that all oh, that ruffles feathers. <laughs> yes, sir. between the Quran and the Bible is the Bible's God inspired and the Quran was man made and uh, that's the difference When, uh, when, I, when I was a child, uh, we had fallout shelters because communism was the number one uh, nemesis menace of the world. All right, Communism is based on ideology. Most communists don't blow themselves up. A Muslim will smile at you while he's blowing you and himself up. That's true. All right, let's have a word of prayer. We'll let you go. They're going to stand outside. We run over time here. Brother Lee, will you dismiss us?